The next speaker for the day is Dr. U. Deva Priya Kumar, Associate Professor and Head, Center for Computational Natural Science and Bioinformatics, International Institute of Information Technology, Hyderabad. Sir pursued MSc in Chemical Science, MPhil and PhD in Computational Chemistry from Pondicherry University. Sir was a postdoctoral fellow at University of Maryland, Baltimore, after which Sir joined as Assistant Professor at CCNSB, IIIT, Hyderabad. Sir was an invited associate professor at Institute of Molecular Science, Japan in the years 2014, 15 and 19. Sir was also a JSPS invitation fellow at the Institute of Molecular Science, Japan in the year 2017. Sir was a visiting researcher at University of Strathclyde, Glasgow, Scotland in the year 2018. Currently, Sir is working as associate professor and head of CCNSB and also academic head of technology innovation hub at IIIT Hyderabad under the national mission for interdisciplinary cyber physical systems. Sir is a recipient of several awards and recognitions such as DST DFG award to participate in the meeting of Nobel laureates, young scientist research award by department of atomic energy, AICTE career award for young teachers, innovative young biotechnologist award from department of biotechnology, Young Scientist Medal in Chemical Sciences from Indian National Science Academy and Distinguished Lecture Award from the Chemical Society of Japan, Chemical Research Society of India Bronze Medal. Sir was a co-convener and convener of several national and international workshops, winter schools and conferences over the years. Research areas in Dr. Devasar's lab include a blend of molecular dynamics, quantum mechanics and machine learning. It includes machine learning in chemis chemistry and biology, protein ligand binding, protein DNA interactions, protein folding equilibrium upon chemical thermal and mechanical stress, multi-scale modeling of chemical modifications to DNA and enzymatic reactions, transmembrane protein modeling, ion permeation and artificial ion channels. Sir has around 110 international publications in various research journals. Sir has several ongoing funded projects from various funding agencies like DST, DAE BRNS, AICTE, DBT, DST SERB, Intel and so on. Today, Sir is speaking on Artificial Intelligence for Chemistry and Drug Design. Sairam. Okay, so hello everyone. Um, uh, thank you Dr. Patricia for a very kind uh, introduction and also the invitation. So before I start, let me thank, thank by, uh, you know, start by thanking uh, Professor Sundareshan, Professor Nagesh Rao, uh, Dr. Pratusha and everyone else in the committee for, you know, uh, inviting me to, uh, you know, uh, to give a talk in this, uh, you know, very nice symposium. I, I saw the schedule and then, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, very nice lineup of talks and I hope the participants are uh, yeah, enjoying. Okay, so uh, um, today, uh, as, uh, you know, Dr. Pratusha introduced, you know, I'm uh, Deva from uh, this institute called Triple IT Hyderabad. And today I thought I will uh, talk a little bit about um, how artificial intelligence method can be uh, or useful um, in, in chemistry in uh, general and maybe uh, one or two examples I will give in uh, uh, drug design. Okay, so, um, so, you know, recently, you know, you have uh, all of us have been witnessing that, you know, people have been uh, talking about artificial intelligence you know, in a, you know, in different contexts, right? In all kinds of contexts, we speak about artificial um, uh, intelligence, right? So, you know, you know, even if you look at newspapers or um, uh, if you look at, you know, uh, news or, you know, in general, you know, uh, people talk a lot about um, artificial intelligence, okay? So in the same context, you know, people recently have started talking about deep learning and machine learning is something that existed for a long time, right? So these these are some of the buzzwords that we have been hearing um, in a large number of uh, contexts. Okay, so you know what I will um, try to do today is to give some examples of uh, you know how these methods, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning methods, can be used in uh, chemistry. Okay. So in general, when we speak about artificial intelligence or machine learning, we, you know, hear uh, about these, uh, you know, algorithms or methods in a large number of contexts, right? For example, in case of, uh, you know, marketing or uh, social media 
or automation like so self driving cars or autonomous vehicles and also like uh, the travel you know and whether whether managing air traffic or uh, the dynamic pricing or you know a large number of industries right so you know, for example if we uh, you know if you are on uh, any one of the social media um, you know um, uh, platforms right or you have shopped uh, from uh, online uh, websites right you know you do shopping online right so you know you know all these um you know places artificial intelligence is uh, uh, you know methods or uh, fundamental okay so you know they use it very um you know uh, you know they use it very very uh, you know effectively in some sense right and today we you know we talk about um, you know uh, like smart speakers you know when we when we ask questions these speakers uh, you know are able to understand what we speak and then they process the information and then collect the information and then be able to deliver it back to us right so these are the some of the um, applications that we see in um, applications of artificial intelligence methods okay so now you know if you look at this part here right as you can see you know people also use artificial intelligence method or people have started using artificial intelligence methods in uh, healthcare okay so what is uh, you know what is healthcare you know healthcare you know is in different contexts it could be uh, in terms of uh, you know uh, preventive uh, disease public health or uh, in terms of effective diagnosis of diseases or you know even in treatment or you know discovering new drugs for example okay so these are some of the different areas or broad areas within healthcare and we are going to talk little bit about uh, drug design in this uh, aspect and also if time permits i will also give an example of um, uh, how artificial intelligence method can be used uh, in public health you know overall uh, health you know if there is time uh, maybe we'll talk about it at the end right so and then uh, later i will give you know some flavor of you know slowly these methods have you know we have started using in the fundamental sciences as well for example you know if you look at chemistry or biology or physics okay so traditionally we use you know physics based methods we have a theory and maybe i'll go to the next slide and explain right so if you take chemistry as an uh, you know chemistry in principle is an experimental science okay i mean there is no question you know i you know though we talk about computational chemistry and theoretical chemistry right you know chemistry is uh, uh, um, you know, fundamentally an experimental science and the experiments are the ones which give rise to real life applications okay so and then the theory and computations help these experiments to deliver better or to you know kind of minimize the number of experiments or to make uh, or to design better experiments and so on so these things can help right so what is this that i have drawn here so we do experiments and make certain observations right you know when we do an experiment in a lab right so we make observations okay so what we do after that is once we have a set of observations we try to understand why we got such a you know so, such a set of observations for example right so that's basically theory you know we try to understand the theory behind these uh, you know observations and and make a theory for like saying okay so this is the theory that explains this particular observations okay and then we go back and forth and then make our theory very very strong right and then after that what we do is like you know we take use this theory to predict new things right you know that's the one which leads to newer applications and helps us to de design or uh, helps us to you know do better experiments and hence you know faster and efficient real life applications okay so now the question is where is artificial intelligence in this cycle so this is the cycle that we know for a very very long time right so we know this uh, you know that this is how it is we do experiments you know make a theory out of it and then do uh, you know computations to predict newer things okay so this is where what we have been doing for a long long time right so now if we say artificial intelligence where are they so it's basically somewhere here being like i take the data from the experiments right i come up with a machine learning model which i use to do computations and then do uh, this one instead of forming a uh, making a theory okay so why because you know it may be faster or because my theory is not so strong or i am not able to come up with a theory which exactly experiment explain all the experiments or the data is really large for us to really understand and then use that in this particular cycle okay so that's where the um, uh, uh, the experiments uh, or, or the um, you know machine learning or the artificial intelligence methods are 
um, useful. Right. So application of artificial intelligence methods, you know, these are really not new in fundamental sciences. OK, so, for example, what you see here is the example of a, a paper right? that was published in 1973. That's almost, uh, you know, 50 years ago. Right. So this is one of the earliest methods where, you know, machine learning methods were actually used uh, in, you know, in chemistry or in, in fundamental uh, sciences, in this case, uh, drug design. OK. So basically what they did, they took this particular set of compounds, right? These are called 1,3-dioxanes, right? They, they took a particular set of compounds, right? And then they used a machine learning or theoretical machine learning approach to classify whether it can be ph pharmacologically active or not, right? Almost 50 years ago, right? But then, you know, the, the, the attraction or uh, in terms of the number of applications in fundamental sciences was very very rare okay but if you look at you know the effect or the number of papers for example that are published in the recent years it's increasing uh, you know exponentially so why is there uh, such a big interest you know there are several reasons we are not going into the details of all of them but then you know methods how methods have become very powerful data has become um, uh, more and more available compared to some years ago and then of course there are a large number of libraries available Right. And then, of course, the computational um, architectures themselves have changed to the better. Right? We, we, have, we have better machines today that can be used, um, uh, you know, to do this, uh, you know, to apply this machine, the, to apply these methods uh, very uh, effectively. Right? All of these things have contributed to such a uh, large increase in this particular uh, space. OK, so now um, let's try to understand. Um, uh, what we mean by machine learning or what we mean by, uh, you know, machine learning applied to, um, you know, sciences, okay? So in general, when we say computational chemistry, right? When we say, you know, uh, when we say I, you know, I do uh, predictions using computations or I do computational chemistry, traditionally what that means is this, that I use a computer, right, to uh, get some output to understand some chemical phenomena. Okay, it could be some, um, you know, it could be a reaction. It could be, um, uh, it could be, uh, you know, uh, it could be like any kind of property that we want to uh, predict and all those things, right? Um, you know, that's that's basically uh, what a computational chemist normally would do. You, you you try to get an output from a computer and then use that output to, you know, predict newer things in chemistry. How do I do it? Do I, I have to have a program, right? I have to have a software that can be loaded onto the computer and then it can the computer can use this program to generate the output and then of course you have to have an input so just to give an example right let's not worry about the bottom one for now let's work look at this okay so gaussian for example and some of you may or may not know but it, it's okay you know gaussian gms or uh, doc autodoc schrodinger um, you know, NAMD, VMD, all these are examples of software programs that we use in uh, computational chemistry. Okay, so if we have a program and then we have a structure, right? So what we do is we give these to the computer and then say, you know, for this particular input, that is for this particular structure, I want this computer to use this program to calculate a certain property. For example, it could be the energy of a system or I want to calculate for example, reactivity, or I want to know how this reaction goes and things like that. So I, I this is how traditionally, um, you know, a computation is done. Okay, this is how com computation chemistry works. So what is the difference between the regular computation and machine learning? It's basically what we have done is we have swapped the output and the program. I have taken the output, put it on the other side. I took the program and put it on this side. That's basically I swap these two, right? So now what we are saying is you have a computer but I don't have a program, but then I have input and then uh, corresponding outputs. Somehow I have, okay, I have, I give this to the computer and I ask the computer to figure out what program or what computer code can take this input and generate this particular output. Okay, so and then the computer is writing the program for us. Okay, so once the computer has written us a code, I can use that back here and then do this particular calculation. So I, I hope I made my, uh, you know, point clear. But I, I'll take a very simple um, uh, example, right? 
So what I'm saying in principle is that I give the molecular structure and instead of giving the program, I give the properties, okay? And then ask the computer to figure out a program. That is what is called, usually called a machine learning model. And that we can use to do regular computations for future, um, you know, uh, examples. Right, so we'll take a very simple uh, scenario, okay? So what we will do is, um, okay, so let's, let's go to this slide, all right? So if I tell you that for a value of x equals, let's say five, the value of y is, you know, uh, let's say uh, nine. For a value of uh, x equals 10, it's, uh, you know, 20. Okay, so for a value of x equals 15, the value is uh, 31. And for value of 20, uh, that's 20, yeah. That's 20, the number is, let's say, 40, you know and what value of 100, the value is 202, and so on, okay? So, in principle, what is given to you now is a set of two values, all right? So, what are that set of two values? I give, you know, for any given x, you know, we give you what is the value of y, okay? So, now, finally, what we ask you is that, let's say, okay, in this way, for a value of 60, what would be the value of y? Okay, so that's the question that we are asking. That's, that's what I want to know. Right. So these are the examples that we have given. Right. And then this is what we have to figure out. And for us, you know, we know how to do it. Right. So how do we do it? You know, I just look at these two numbers. I, I can, you know, do a linear regression and all that, but just do the simplest way possible. I look at these numbers and then I see approximately the value of y equals to x. Okay. So that's approximately, right. Approximately, if you look at all of these numbers, you see that. Uh, the value of y is approximately equal to two times the value of x. And hence, you know, I will say that this number is close to 120. Okay. So in principle, I did not, or initially we did not tell that the, uh, you know, x and y are related by this formula. Okay. We did not tell that. So what all we told is this set of numbers. And then we just asked, simply asked a question. We went back and figured out that the relationship between X and Y is this, and hence the value of this has to be this. That's exactly what machine learning is. So for a given value of X and Y, we want the computer to figure out what this F is. What is a function which relates X and Y, okay? So normally what we would do in a traditional programming sense, you know, we tell the computer what is this F, and then in, in terms of uh, understanding, in, in terms of taking the out, we give an input of X and then ask the computer, what is the value of Y? Okay, given F. But now in machine learning, the difference is that I do not give F. I ask the computer, what is this F? Okay, I give you the simple examples of X and Y and ask the computer to figure out what this F is. Okay, so that's the fundamental difference between the traditional computation that we do uh, in, in um, chemistry versus the kind of um, uh, applications that we do with machine learning in chemistry or otherwise, all right? Okay, so I'm, now I'm going. What I'm going to do is to give a few examples, okay, of how you know uh, 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 machine learning methods can be used um, in chemistry and uh, drug design. Okay, all right. So now, just give me a second. Okay. So, um, all right. So let's take this particular example. Okay. So I, I'm going to uh, try and give uh, three or four examples. Okay. Of, of how we can apply, um, you know, chemistry or, or machine learning methods to um, uh, to uh, uh, machine learning methods to um, um, you know chemistry and drug design. Okay. So the first example. Right, which we call uh, band N N. Right, so let's 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 just talk about this briefly. Okay, so now uh, let us assume that uh, what I want to do is to take some molecule. Right, it could be methane, it could be uh, you know uh, hexane, it could be benzene, it could be uh, you know really large molecule like a DNA protein, or it could be anything. Okay, I take a molecule, and then I want to calculate. Uh, properties of these molecules. Okay, so that's basically what I want, right? So, you know, the most of the, you know, we 
the, the you know the method of choice usually is uh, quantum mechanics why because we know quantum mechanics uh, you know gives accurate uh, molecular properties okay so you know we use quantum mechanics but then the issue is that we cannot use this method to really large systems right for example if you have 10000 atoms we cannot use quantum mechanics it's just not um, possible right? with the with the kind of computer resources we have today it's not practical to do that kind of calculations and hence what we do we do approximations and use something called molecular mechanics details of which we will not go into right you know this is uh, just assume that this is an approximate method that can you know calculate energy right it's extremely fast and hence i can apply it to really large systems but then uh, in terms of the accuracy of that method you know, it's very uh, low so now what we say is like you know i want to use machine learning right and you know i but the two objectives one is that it is as fast as molecular mechanics right I, this is still an approximate method but it's very fast okay but then in terms of the accuracy i want it high so that's the overall aim of this particular project so you know just to quickly uh, tell in one sentence it's like we want to use machine learning to predict uh, properties which with very high accuracy okay but at the same time with a very low computational uh, expense uh, with a, in a short amount of time we want to um, calculate uh, this particular uh, numbers right so basically what we uh, what we normally do is this we take the structure of the molecule okay and then you get the energy of the molecule for example using qm quantum mechanics okay so that's what we normally um, do okay so let us assume that you know i i have some examples of this for a given set of structures i have the energy now what i want to do is first i want to do is represent the structure i have to tell the computer okay this is the structure okay so for example you know this you know is a uh, formaldehyde right uh, no formamide sorry that's a, that's a formamide right so you have a CH, uh, CO, NH2, eh? HCO, NH2. That's a formamide, right? So now I have to tell the computer, okay, this is the molecule on which I want to do some uh, calculations on, but I want to do uh, use machine learning, okay? So, you know, this is just, you know, a description of how we represent the molecule, right? And once I decide that, you know, I have the Cartesian coordinates or the nuclear positions of each of the atoms in the system that's basically what we have and what i want at the end is let's say the energy of the molecule right so this is what we start with that's the input okay and energy is the output okay so that's basically what we want right so and uh, i i create a list based on what i showed in the previous slide and then use uh, what we call uh, you know artificial neural network and then try to get the uh, energy of the system Okay, so we call it this band because we represent this in terms of bonds B, A, and uh, D, right? So bonds, angles, non-bonds, and dihedrals. So that's why we call it um, uh, band. Okay, so now we'll not go into details of how we do this and so on, but the idea is that we have a large number of uh, structures with their Cartesian coordinates um, and the corresponding energies, and then we train this network to reproduce the energy starting from this set of coordinates. That's basically the idea, right? So once we have this network trained, you use that network to predict energies of newer, uh, new, new molecular systems. Okay, so, you know, for example, let's just take uh, some, you know, uh, very simple example, okay? So what I have in this slide, all these molecules here, all of them are uh, C11H22 uh, isomers. Okay, I have a lot, uh, like around 15 or so, um, you know, uh, C11H22 isomers, right? So as you can see, you know, there are, you know, different kinds. Okay, okay. You have like some with uh, six member rings, some with five member rings, you know, some with double bonds, right? Branched chains and linear chains, right? And then you have uh, some four member rings, three member rings and so on. And, you know, it, it covers a reasonable, um, uh, you know, diverse set of compounds on which I'm calculating the energy of the molecule, okay? So what I'm showing, for example, the blue line corresponds to 
the actual quantum mechanical energy, right? I do a proper quantum mechanical calculation and then get the energy of that particular system. So now we use, you know, apply, you know, I get the ener energies of exact same set of molecules using the machine learning method, okay? So as you can see, the differences between them are, uh, are reasonably small, right? No, not, you know, it's not a big difference, right? So it's not a big difference, okay? So just for comparison, we also have, uh, you know, numbers, uh, some some semi-empirical uh, QM method, which takes actually longer than this, you know, this takes longer time, but it's still uh, not so accurate, right? This is the ground truth, and this is where we uh, predict. So similarly, for example, you know, if I look at uh, the energy corresponding to stretching of a bond or, uh, you know, uh, bending, like bending of a bond, right? CCC bending and so on, right? You know, they, uh, you know, compare reasonably uh, well, right? And, you know, these are some of the uh, reactions that some of you may uh, recognize, um, you know, pretty easily, right? For example, here is just a, uh, you know, uh, this difference between these two, you know, there's no reaction here. It's just the conformation is different such that there is an intramolecular hydrogen bond here and there is no intramolecular hydrogen bond here. This is hydrogenation of an alkene. It's a simple diels solder reaction. Uh, it's an aldol condensation, esterification reaction, and then that's a, a rearrangement reaction and so on, electrocyclic uh, uh, reaction and so on, right? So if, if, for example, if I take the reaction energies or the delta E corresponding to this particular uh, reaction, right? So the energy of the product minus the energy of the uh, reactant, okay? So if you look at them, so this is what, these are the numbers that I get for these, uh, you know, for these things using the actual quantum mechanical calculations. Now, you know, I, I do uh, the machine learning method, which takes, you know, very, very uh, short amount of time, few uh, milliseconds, right? So this takes, let's say this take about one hour. So this takes like a millisecond, okay? It's extremely fast. As you can see, the numbers are very, very close. And if I take this one, which would possibly take about 10 minutes or so, if I take that, you know, even it even gets the, uh, you know, the sign wrong, the, 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 um, or the, the sign of the delta E wrong, right? So that way uh, it does, uh, <coughs> excuse me, we do uh, reasonably well, <coughs> right? So now, um, so I'm going to take a second example of uh, a method or of a, a, a problem where uh, machine learning can be used. Okay, so what is the first one we tried to discuss? The first one we discussed was that for a given chemical structure, right? What is the energy? Usually this kind of question is answered by using quantum mechanics reliably. You can also use molecular mechanics, but the accuracy is low. But here, what we do is we use machine learning to answer that question saying, okay, for a given structure, the, what is the energy of the molecule? And, uh, you know, um, what is the energy of the molecule? And then the second one is we do it extremely uh, fast, right? So the second example that I'm gonna take is um, uh, what we call uh, uh, de novo uh, molecular design or de novo uh, drug design, okay? So usually in chemistry, whether experiments or, um, uh, you know, uh, computations, you know, when you do some experiments in a research lab, for example, organic chemistry lab or medicinal chemistry lab or inorganic chemistry, whatever it is, right? So when we do our, most of the time, what we want to do is to design a molecule or to come up with a new molecule that has a specific molecular property. So for example, um, you know, I, I, I want to design a drug which will bind to a certain protein very uh, efficiently, or uh, I want to design a molecule which will have uh, very nice NLO uh, properties, or I want to design a molecule which is which has, uh, you know, um, like a light, light absorption, like spectroscopic with a certain spectroscopic property and so on, right? So that's, that's what we do, you know, in, in computation or um, uh, experiment. Right, but we, when when we sit and do it, what we do is we come up with a new molecule and then do a computation or do an experiment and then say, what is that value? Right, when we do an experiment, 
and then we ask what is the property right so i, I start with a with with a um, molecule and then do an ex computation or an experiment and then ask what is the property right in principle what we want is the opposite what i'm asking is like i want a molecule this is what i want with a certain molecular property right so this is what is called um, inverse design okay right instead of asking given a molecule what is the property now we are asking the other way around so given a i'm saying i want a molecule i want a molecule with a certain property that's basically what we are asking now okay so this is a second kind of thing that uh, you know one can do right so basically the idea is this that you know instead of one uh, you know like a one uh, neural network that that i showed previously now you have two networks let's call this the generator okay so that's the uh, generator right we will not worry about uh, what these things are let's say that these are also you know artificial neural networks which can do something what is it that can do this is a neural network which can generate okay what do you mean by generate when i say when i ask this model saying can you suggest a new molecule it will tell give a, give a new molecule to us okay and uh, what is this one this is a predictor it's like previously what i said is if i give a structure i the, the the machine learning model will give me the energy like that if i give a structure to this it will give you know a certain property so that's basically the job of this one so what we do now is this so now instead of saying for any given structure predict the property now what we are saying for a given property that i want to generate a new structure so that's basically this part that we have okay so um, um so the idea is uh, you know uh, simple where we have trained a, a model which is capable of chemically or generating chemically meaningful let's say drug like molecules for example this is uh, you know this one here so that is a representation of a molecule huh? usually what is called uh, smiles right if someone is uh, working in computational chemistry you may quickly uh, recognize this particular uh, phrase okay so that's that me that you know if if someone uh, gives you this one right you should you know you, you you will be able to go back and say oh this is the molecule right so that's basically uh, the idea of this so basically this particular g or the generator is capable of generating new molecules and this particular uh, p or the predictor is capable of predicting a property given a structure so it gives a structure it can predict the um, it can predict the property so now what i say is that if the property that is predicted is close to what i want right i i will take an example okay Uh, if i if it is very close to what i want and then we say okay give a reward to the system right you know you appreciate the generator saying okay you are doing the job that you are supposed to do on the other hand if the predicted uh, property is way too different from what we want then you penalize you punish the system saying okay this is you are nowhere close right so you better uh, do better right um so that's you know it it learns uh, that particular process okay so i will um you know i i we will take two examples okay that that will make uh, uh, that will uh, hopefully make this point uh, slightly more um, clear right okay so now um so what i have here right don't worry about all that so let's just talk about uh, two properties okay so one is what is called a log p um and second is we'll get back to the second one so let's just talk about log p okay so when i have a drug molecule right when i have a drug right when for example we take medicine now huh? we'll take like uh, you know each of us would have taken some medicine or other okay so how do how do how do these drugs uh, work you know we take the medicine and then these uh, drugs are capable or these drug molecules are capable of um you know going to the target protein and then bind to the protein and hence show a pharmacological effect okay so one of the criteria for these molecules to work is the ability of these molecules to cross these lipid bilayers or cross the cell membrane okay so for example this is the uh, you know uh, let's assume that this is a cell okay so let's assume that this is a large cell okay 
So we know the cells are made up of, the boundary of the cells are made up of these lipid bilayers, right? Nampophilic molecules, which are lipid bilayers, okay? So when a drug molecule is coming in, let's say a drug molecule is coming in, right? So when it comes to the, near the cell, right? It, it supposed it has to cross the membrane and go inside and hence it can bind to a protein, right? Let's say only it has to go inside for it to bind to a protein. Okay, so this particular value log p, you know, if the value is between zero to five, right? We will again. Some of you may know about this. Log p basically is the uh, partition co coefficient um, uh, in, in a water octanol uh, system. But if you do not know, it's okay. So basically, the idea is that if the value of this log p, if that value is between zero to five, the molecule is likely to enter this. Okay, if it is more than five or less than zero, it cannot uh, enter. Okay, it cannot enter and hence the drug will not work. So basically the idea is any drug molecule that we are designing that will that will target an intracellular uh, protein, right? It has to have a value of zero to five. Right? That's basically the idea. The second property, second one is what is called a, a synthetic accessibility score, right? You know, whatever said and done, we are still working on the computers, okay? So even if you are suggesting a new molecule, you know, it should be synthesizable or somebody should be able to uh, make it, right? You know, it, it has to be made in a, 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 in, a um, in an organic chemistry lab for it to be useful, right? So, you know, this particular, uh, you know, measure, the synthetic accessibility score, you know, this is, you know, people have come up with this method where they say, you know, they, have, they say that it has a value from zero to 10. And if the value is very high or above five or something, it is it is very, very difficult to synthesize that particular molecule. If the value is less than five, then it is, you know, reasonably easy to synthesize, right? So what is it that we want? Two things. One is I want the machine learning model to generate molecules, which are uh, which have a log p value of zero to five, okay, and then the molecule should be synthesizable or should have a lower score, right? You know, that's basically the idea. So, so that's what we have here, right? So in, let's assume. Let us assume that I am trying to uh, generate molecules, okay and the values of the log p should be between zero and five, okay? So initially, if I do not have any conditions saying, you know, I do not have any, uh, uh, what do you call, um, bias towards uh, where I have, uh, you know, where I want these numbers, this is how the distribution looks like. And similarly, if, um, you know, if for this is for the synthetic accessibility, accessibility score, if I do not have any uh, bias, then this is how the distribution looks like. As I said, you know, towards the right, it's very hard to make it. Towards the left, it's easy to make it. And similarly here, if it is between these two lines, it can enter a cell. If it is beyond this or below this, it cannot enter the cell. Okay, so now we say that, okay, now we bias the generation and say that, you know, I want the, you know, molecules to have a certain value, right, of these two. Basically, this is how it looks like. Okay. Okay, so basically what we have achieved by doing this is that, you know, we have uh, brought this distribution between only zero and five. You know, if you see most of it, almost 99% or more than 99% of them have values between zero and five, the, the pink one. And similarly, if you look at this one, uh, originally, it, you know, it proposed molecules which are difficult to synthesize, but, you know, now all the molecules that are being generated or easy to synthesize, right? So that's uh, uh, another uh, example, you know, interesting way of doing uh, uh, inverse uh, drug design, right? So the time is 3.10. I think I'm supposed to go up to 3.25. At least, let's say, five minutes. I have, let's say, 10 minutes, a maximum of 10 minutes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. All right, so, you know, uh, maybe... All right, so let, let's let me go to the next example. This is uh, not um, much to do with um, uh, chemistry, really, but this is something that uh, you know that is um, kind of 
uh, what do you call uh, relevant to today's um, you know pandemic situation okay so recently about uh, um, six months ago we started working on this particular uh, project where we said right when we have this COVID-19 um, situation what we know is that you know most of them right you know if, if you take India more than 99 percent of the ones who were infected by this virus you know recovered without um, much of a problem right so or you know at more than 99 percent of them actually survived right and uh, a reasonable um, number of them have absolutely zero uh, complications right but then you know there's a, a population which actually did not survive and then there is a small population which also um, they were affected very severely, but then they survived, right? So one of the projects that we uh, undertook about six months ago is to be able to look at the um, the lab clinical data, right? The clinical um, blood parameters, hematological parameters, and then use that to predict this, you know, population of the patients or the a proportion of the patients who are at higher risk, right? So let's say there are 100 people, right? 90% of them, you know, no problem. Even if they were infected, they would come out of the, you know, to be after two weeks, they will just be fine. And then there's a small population who are at very high risk, but then they survive. And then there is another very small population who are at extreme high risk, and then they do not survive, right? So if, let us assume that as soon as someone is infected, Right? We are able to put a label or, put, you know, put uh, not a label. What I'm saying is like we are able to predict how, uh, you know, um, the, the risk of the patient, right? If you're able to predict the risk of the patient, whether, you know, it's in the high risk or in the low risk, right? You know, that, you know, will help in reducing the, um, you know, damage or, you know, because we can direct all the available resources, whether it's uh, doctors or the hospitals, uh, infrastructure or medication and all that towards the people who are at higher risk, right? So um, basically what we did was, um, you know, I, I'll quickly go through it. So basically what we did was we took a data set. What is the data set? Data set is a list of patients, okay? A large number of patients and their corresponding uh, hematological uh, parameters, right? For example, you know, the lymphocyte count or neutrophil count, right? LDH, the C-reactive protein, uh, D-dimer, right, and then other parameters like age and you know whether they actually needed uh, oxygen, um, you know, supplemental uh, oxygen or were they on ventilator or not, and, and all those kind of parameters. Okay, so that's basically the data set. We take a data set of the patients and then their you know uh, lab parameters, and then use that, and then use the machine learning to model to predict okay so to predict whether you know the patient will actually is at high risk or um, low risk okay so that's basically what we did and then uh, as you can see here right for example let's take this okay so as you can see you know we are able to predict a given patient is high risk or low risk you know after affected by covid-19 you know at very very high accuracy um levels okay it's very well in advance right so this was done what was you know this is interesting and then it is uh, also good uh, but then the data set that i'm talking about comes from uh, a, you know a chinese uh, cohort of the patients all of them were from a from one single hospital from china wuhan actually it's, it was in wuhan and uh, once we were confident of you know creating these machine learning models that can do that this kind of uh, you know prediction we went on to see if we can apply this to the indian population right because you know whatever said and done we have to be able to do it on the indian uh, patients right so that's basically what we did so we um, you know we went and then we uh, had a good collaboration uh, with uh, uh, max hospitals uh, in delhi and also with uh, csr igab and so on and then we collected um, you know a large uh, data set of uh, you know patients from max hospitals and then their uh, parameters different kinds of blood uh, parameters and then you know of different risks so for for example some of them were you know remained at home some of them hospitalized 
and uh, some of them needed uh, respiratory support and some of them did not survive out of these uh, patients that we started uh, uh, working with right so we took this data and then we did a similar exercise and then uh, we try to start from this data set of these uh, indian patients and then try to come up with uh, models uh, in terms of predicting um, you know um, uh, machine learning models for predicting whether a given patient is of high risk or um, low risk okay so for example if you look at this one right so you know this is basically uh, the day of the outcome the day of the outcome what do we mean by outcome outcome could be like okay this patient was in the hospital but on this day the patient was discharged or on this day um, you know the patient recovered completely and went home or the patient you know did not uh, actually survive after the infection right? that's the day of the outcome so as you can see we can predict the risk of the patient you know much uh, you know well in advance up to 10 to uh, you know, 10 to 12 days in advance in terms of how uh, risk uh, or what is the kind of risk that particular patient um, has. And hence, you know, the treatment protocols can be made, um, you know, easier for them, or, you know, more effective for them, right? Okay, so um, I did not show one particular example, but that's okay, right? At least I was able to show um, three examples, okay? Where uh, first, of course, you know what I try to impress upon is that in addition to traditional uh, methods, traditional computational methods like uh, quantum mechanics, classical mechanics, statistical mechanics, and so on, right? In addition to these methods, artificial intelligence methods and machine learning methods have become indispensable, and then you know people have started using it very, very effectively to do chemistry or to you know, design molecules or to design drugs or to design materials or to understand certain, uh, uh, you know, biological phenomena, right? So, you know, what I tried to do was to give uh, some examples. The first example that I showed was given a structure of a molecule, can you give me what the energy is, right? And the second one I didn't speak about. And then the, this one is about, you know, given or asking, saying, you know, I want a molecule with a certain property can you have a machine learning method which can generate structures or generate new molecules, right? And third one, I um, you know try to give a you know recent, very recent example of how we could use these machine learning methods, you know, in in a larger healthcare uh, setting, right? You know, this can be up, you know apply, you know, applied to you know anybody without any uh, problem, very highly scalable, right? So with that. Uh, I will um, uh, stop. Uh, these are some of the uh, current students who have been contributing to this project. And, um, you know, the collaborators, especially on the last two things were Intel and CSAR, and then uh, funding comes from um, these resources. And uh, thank you for uh, the attention. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you again. Again, uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk. Uh, and then, you know, uh, present some of our uh, work in this uh, audience, to this audience. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Deva. The talk was so in insightful about how machine learning was, uh, it's so relevant to predict the behavior of chemical species. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have uh, a few questions. Uh, the first question being, uh, you have mentioned that in re reinforcement of learning, Based on the prediction, we either reward or punish the generator. Mm -hmm. What exactly qualifies as a reward and what qualifies as a punishment for a generator? Okay. Uh, so basically, um, you know, we uh, use, uh, for example, uh, let me go to that slide. Maybe easier. So, right. So, you know, one simplest way uh, to look at is uh, like this. So for example, here, right? So here I spoke about, uh, I want these numbers to be as low as possible, right? So we try to come up with reward functions that uh, kind of, um, I'm, 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 can you see my screen? I, I think I still shared. Yes, sir. We are able to see. Okay, so you know basically, you know, if I if I take the uh, synthetic accessibility score, okay, so what I want here is that I want this number to be as low as possible, 
right so in principle i can um, you know um, you know keep the award to be something like this this could be like an exponential function right that that exponential function could be my um, uh, reward function right so basically i am trying to maximize this value right so that's that's one way of uh, looking at it for example here i could uh, have uh, you know uh, this could be my uh, gaussian function like this could be my reward or this could be my reward and so on right so basically i come up with reward functions like this this or this and then i can maximize that particular uh, value of the function with respect to the generator right that's one simplest way of uh, saying it right Uh, the second question uh, is that uh, recently Google's AI DeepMind was able to solve the 3D structure of a protein from amino acid sequence. Could you elaborate on the future of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning in this regard in the field of medicinal chemistry? What implications would it have in the future of medicinal chemistry? yeah so um, yeah so you know so i think you know most of you have been following it up very nicely so recently in the, this is the news that came out about two to three weeks ago in terms of how uh, deep mind was able you know is able to predict um, you know three dimensional structures of proteins uh, just from sequences very very uh, accurately right actually you know they did a wonderful job job two years ago in the CASP uh, competition, right, in 2018, December, and then they have continued uh, the success now, and then they have done, uh, you know, much um, better than before, right? So in that sense, you know, you already, you know, appreciate the pace at which we are moving in terms of how data-driven uh, methods are, uh, you know, driving the area of fundamental sciences, right? So in that sense, you know, uh, the in the years to come, we will see much uh, more advances and much more contributions, um, you know, the artificial intelligence and the machine learning methods will make to the traditional subjects like uh, chemistry in general, you know, chemistry or, you know, any, um, for example, you spoke about medicinal chemistry. So in, in drug design, I, I give you a simple example. In, um, <clears throat> in about three years ago, right, uh, in 2017, uh, late 2017, I think November 2017, right? So the number of startup companies that existed in the space of artificial intelligence applied to drug design was around 80, if I remember right, right? If you look at that same number two and a half years later, that is March uh, 2020, that this early this year, right? That number became um, close to 280, right? It's like a you know increase of like almost to 250 percent right so that's a huge uh, surge in terms of how the new more and more new players are coming to the field and uh, uh, they are actually you know taking the uh, you know this particular area um, very uh, you know uh, much forward yeah so uh, you know the the short answer to that question is in the years to come you will see uh, uh, much more uh, applications successful applications in uh, you know uh, molecular design right uh, the next question how does the knowledge of log p value and synthesizability help in drug design um okay so one um, yeah one thing i should say is like the values of log p and uh, synthetic accessibility or uh, still properties which uh, we use to show that this particular method uh, works, right? In terms of the utility itself, of course, log P has to be in a certain range uh, for it to cross a lipid bilayer, right? Second one, synthesizability. Now, I can, you know, we can have any kind of fancy algorithms and then propose new kinds of molecules. And eventually, at the end of the day, for the molecule to be useful, somebody should be able to actually make it in a lab, right? So that synthesize that the synthesizability score or the synthetic accessibility score that quantifies in terms of how easy or difficult it is it is for someone to synthesize in a lab, right? So that way you know they are useful, okay? But then there are more questions to answer, not just these two. These two are important, but then 
you also have to uh, you know consider uh, many other objectives right so you know I, I i showed that this particular machine learning methods is very powerful in situations like this by taking those two as examples right but we have to ask more questions yeah very, very nice questions yeah thank you there is a last question sir uh, sure. what is your opinion on dl ml methods applied for prediction of pkd values do you think using md to generate an equilibrated structure before using ml is better um again a very nice question uh, so basically you know in, in medicinal chemistry or drug design uh, projects one of the main objectives is to be able to predict um kd values or the you know binding affinity values accurately right so you know if i use only a one particular structure and then try to predict uh, affinity values you now i am going to the accuracy of that is going to go up to only a certain level right but then you will uh, what uh, you know a lot of us think is that a combination of the machine learning methods and the traditional methods like for example as you rightly said you know we do some md and then take the information from there and then use that also in addition to a single structure in your machine learning and then see if the accuracy uh, of the predicted values uh, are high right these are you know you know valid uh, are very nice questions and also you know as you, you yourself are giving very very uh, uh, uh what do you call um, uh in excellent answers also yeah absolutely so what i what i'm saying at the end is like a nice combination of the traditional methods and machine learning methods are going to be uh, very very successful yeah for problems like uh, this yeah thank you dr deva for uh, sparing your time for delivering such a wonderful insightful talk uh, we look forward to many talks like this thank you yeah. once again yeah thank you thank you thank you very much yeah thanks uh, again so i have been to uh, your uh, you know university i hope uh, at some day we will uh, visit yeah. again thanks for the opportunity thank you very much yeah.